In the heart of downtown, my daily ritual was a visit to my favorite cafe. One particular morning, I was in shock when a Karen manager kicks a disabled man out. But turns out, he's an undercover CEO. Here's how it all went down. Every morning, like clockwork, I'd head over to my favorite cafe. Honestly, it felt like my second home, but this morning had a different vibe. I was just getting comfy in my go-to spot, you know, the corner seat by the window. When I saw this guy, he had crutches and was having a tough time with the door. I was about to jump up and give him a hand, but out of nowhere, Karen, the new manager, zoomed in. And trust me, from the looks of it, she wasn't going to help. Karen, with her freshly done nails and that classic I'm the boss here haircut, strutted over to the man. He was struggling a bit with his crutches, clearly having some mobility issues. Excuse me, sir, she began, her voice dripping with condescension. But you're kind of in the way. This isn't a place to loiter. The disabled man, looking genuinely surprised, glanced around, probably wondering if she was addressing someone else. I'm just here for some coffee, he replied, a hint of confusion in his voice. Karen, ever the drama queen, rolled her eyes dramatically. Look, you're drawing attention, and not in a good way. Perhaps there's another coffee shop down the street that's more accommodating for your situation, she suggested. I couldn't hold back any longer. Seriously? That's how you're treating a customer? And a disabled one at that? I exclaimed, my voice rising with indignation. Karen shot me a death glare, the kind that could freeze lava. Mind your own business, she snapped. The man, trying to maintain his dignity despite his evident discomfort, said, All I wanted was a simple cup of coffee. I didn't expect to be treated any differently because of my disability. Everyone deserves respect. A murmur of agreement spread through the cafe. It was evident that Karen's behavior wasn't sitting well with the other patrons. But true to form, Karen just crossed her arms, looking even more defiant. She clearly wasn't used to being challenged, especially not in her domain. The atmosphere in the cafe was thick with tension. Karen, with her wild eyes and flaring nostrils, was on a whole other level of mad. I run this place, and I decide who gets to stay and who doesn't, she yelled, pointing accusingly at the man with crutches. You're causing a scene, and I won't have it. Out! Just as the situation seemed to be spiraling out of control, the door opened, and in walked a well-dressed man. He wasn't a regular, but he had that air of authority about him. He quickly assessed the situation, his eyebrows furrowing in concern. Karen, he said in a measured tone, what on earth is going on here? She huffed. This man is being a nuisance, and I'm handling it. The well-dressed man sighed. Karen, do you even know who this is? She smirked. Why should I care? Just another troublemaker. He shook his head. This is the CEO of our entire chain. He's been visiting our cafes undercover to get a first-hand experience. The smug look on Karen's face vanished instantly, replaced by a look of sheer horror. She turned from her supervisor to the owner, her once defiant stance now deflated. The owner, adjusting his crutches, said, I wanted to see how our cafes operate from a regular customer's viewpoint. Today's visit was quite revealing. Karen's voice trembled. I, I had no idea, sir. I'm so sorry. The owner gave a slight nod. Apologies are a start, Karen. But remember, how we treat others, especially when we think no one's watching, defines us. And there are always consequences. Taking in the scene, the supervisor walked over to the owner, extending a hand in apology. I'm so sorry for the way you've been treated, Mr. Daniels. This isn't the kind of environment we want to foster at our cafe. The owner nodded. Thank you. I appreciate that. Then turning to Karen, the supervisor's face was stern. Karen, can I have a word with you outside? The two of them stepped out, and though their conversation was private, it was clear from Karen's body language that it wasn't going well for her. Addressing the cafe, the owner said, I want to apologize for the behavior you witnessed today. At this cafe, we value every customer, and what happened today was unacceptable. Karen will no longer be working here. As for me, I was reminded of the importance of standing up for what's right, even if it means confronting those in authority. This story just goes to show that you never know who's watching and what they might do. It's a shame that Karen had to learn the hard way, but hopefully, this serves as a wake-up call for her and others. Thumbs up for the CEO for taking action and making things right. In the sanctuary of my childhood home, I was jolted awake by the sounds of chaos and betrayal. To my horror, among the masked intruders tearing our lives apart was my own brother, R. Here is how it all went down. Growing up, family dynamics were always a bit complicated. I haven't spoken to one of my brothers since I was about 10, and the events leading up to that decision began when I was just 9. To give you a clearer picture, I have two half-brothers. One is from my mom's previous relationship, and the other from my dad's. At the time of this story, they were 22 and 23, respectively. Both had moved out and were trying to find their own way in the world, but not necessarily in the most constructive manner. They had both ventured into college with hopes and dreams, but somewhere along the way, they lost their direction. They dropped out, and their lives took a turn that none of us had anticipated. While both had their struggles, this particular story revolves around my dad's son. 
whom I'll refer to as R for the sake of privacy. R's descent was particularly alarming. He got entangled in the world of drugs and got swept up into the street life. It was heartbreaking to see someone with so much potential lose their way. But my dad, with his ever-loving heart, couldn't bring himself to give up on R. He always believed that beneath the rough exterior and the bad decisions, R's good heart still existed. To my dad, R was still that little boy who once played in the backyard, and he could do no wrong. Our family, while not swimming in wealth, was always comfortable. My parents worked hard to provide for us and ensure we had a good life. They had been together since a year before I was born, building a life filled with memories, both good and bad. But by the time this story unfolds, their relationship had hit a rocky patch. So here's what happened from my perspective. I was taking a nap when the deafening sound of crashes and shouting jolted me awake. Heart pounding, I tiptoed to the top of the stairs and peeked down. The scene was chaotic. About five people, some with masks, were brandishing weapons and tearing our living room apart. My heart skipped a beat when I saw one of them aggressively shoving my dad against the wall, his voice dripping with menace. Where's the money, old man? Amidst the chaos, a familiar voice reached my ears. It was ours, my own brother. My mind raced, trying to process the betrayal. I retreated to my room, my hands shaking as I dialed my mom. Mom? I whispered, trying to keep my voice steady. Honey, why are you whispering? Is everything okay? She asked, concern evident in her voice. They're here, in the house. They're looking for money. Ours with them. I choked out, tears streaming down my face. She let out a frustrated sigh. Oh God, your father and his blind trust in R. Stay hidden, sweetie. I'm coming home right now. The commotion downstairs grew louder. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream from R echoed through the house, shouting, Dad! The house fell eerily silent. After what felt like an eternity, I mustered the courage to creep downstairs. The sight was gut-wrenching. My dad, pale and drenched in sweat, was slumped on the couch, surrounded by R and his thugs. One of them was on the phone, desperately calling 911. My dad's eyes met mine, filled with pain and regret. Overwhelmed, I let out a scream and ran outside, passing the remnants of our once cozy home and our smashed car. I dialed my mom again, my voice shaking. Mom, dad's hurt, really bad. Just get to the neighbors, honey. I'm almost there, she replied, her voice filled with a mix of fear and anger. The aftermath was devastating. R had orchestrated the break-in, feeling entitled to our family's money. The intense stress of the confrontation had caused my dad to suffer a stroke. Our family was never the same after that day. While dad recovered physically, the emotional scars ran deep. He never pressed charges against R, but the trust was shattered. As for R, he never got the money he so desperately sought and his life continued its downward spiral. The bond we once shared as siblings was irreparably broken. The painful lesson I learned that day was that sometimes, blood isn't always thicker than water. Addiction is such a complex issue that often goes deeper than what meets the eye. Seeking professional help is crucial, and it's essential not to enable or tolerate it. Everyone deserves a chance at recovery and a healthier life. In a world where love stories often follow predictable paths, mine took an unexpected detour. Jake and I found a connection that seemed unbreakable. But as the saying goes, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. Here's how it all went down. At 28, life had a funny way of introducing me to Jake. We met at a mutual friends party, and even though he was from the opposite coast, there was an undeniable spark between us. Our conversations flowed effortlessly, and before we knew it, we were deep into the night, sharing dreams and aspirations. We started dating, and the challenges of a long-distance relationship became our daily reality. Late-night calls, surprise visits, and countless texts filled our days. Once you're done with school, why not come live with me, Jake would often suggest, his voice filled with hope. The decision weighed heavily on me. I had a promising career ahead, having secured a dream job offer from a company I'd interned at and genuinely loved. My friends and family were here. But then, there was Jake with his infectious laughter. He's worth it, I'd tell myself. So I took the leap of faith. Moving to a new city, I embraced a new life with Jake. How about marriage at 30? He'd ask, and I'd laugh, nodding in agreement. Life was good. We had our disagreements, of course, but they were fleeting. Our love was the constant, and it wasn't long before we invested in a house together. One evening, as we sat down for a quiet dinner, Jake's demeanor changed. He looked deep into my eyes and said, I need to talk to you about something. My heart raced. Is he proposing? I thought, but his next words shattered that illusion. I've realized I'm polyamorous, he confessed. I blinked, trying to process his words. Did I? Did I do something wrong? I stammered, my mind racing with a thousand thoughts. No, it's just who I am, he replied, his voice filled with emotion. I tried to understand, to see things from his perspective, but my heart ached. I can't see myself with anyone but you, I told him, tears threatening to spill. He sighed deeply. You're being narrow-minded. Swallowing hard, I asked, Is there someone else? He hesitated, then admitted, There's this woman I met. She's Polly, too. 
but we haven't done anything. That night was one of the longest of my life. I retreated to the guest room, my mind flooded with memories of missed opportunities, sacrifices, and dreams deferred. The next morning, Jake looked like he hadn't slept a wink. I can't change who I am, he whispered, tears streaming down his face. But I don't want to lose you. I need time, I replied, my voice breaking. Time to heal, to understand, to find myself. Over the next month, I took charge of my life. I moved out, found a cozy apartment, and started a new job that reignited my passion. Being close to family was therapeutic, their love and support helping me heal. When our friends and family learned of our breakup, they rallied around me, their understanding and empathy a balm to my wounded heart. As for the house, we decided to sell it, splitting the proceeds. Through mutual friends I heard Jake had started seeing the woman he'd mentioned. I wasn't surprised, but neither was I bitter. Everyone deserves happiness after all. For now, I'm taking a break from dating, focusing on self-love, and rediscovering the joys of solitude. Life has its twists and turns, but in the end I found my path to happiness and peace. It's wild, isn't it? You can spend years with someone and still feel like there's so much left to discover. Sometimes, if the change feels too overwhelming, maybe it's a sign to reevaluate and consider moving on. In a small town where family ties meant everything, I found myself caught in between broken promises and unmet expectations. My dad always had a history of letting me down, but it wasn't just about missed birthdays or forgotten gifts. Here's how it all went down. My parents split when I was nine years old. They were teenagers when they had me, and their relationship was often intense with frequent arguments and shouting. After the split, I stayed with my mother 42 years old in the house they had bought together, while my dad 41 years old moved away to live with a friend named Mike. However, it turned out that Mike was actually Emma, whom my dad had been seeing while he was still with my mom. Eventually, my dad married Emma, but they later divorced. He is now in a relationship with another woman named Jane. After the split, my dad didn't make an effort to see me for months and didn't provide any financial support to my mom to help take care of me. He even tried to have us evicted from the house so he could redecorate and sell it, despite us having nowhere else to stay. Eventually, my mom found us a rented place nearby, where we lived for nearly 10 years. During this time, my dad started to visit me and reluctantly started paying child support. When I turned 13, things took a turn for the worse. You're old enough now, he said one day. You should start getting your own presents for family members. I was taken aback. But dad, I don't have a job or any money. He just shrugged. Figure it out. So most times my mom or other family members had to step in and cover for me. My 18th birthday was supposed to be special. Dad had promised, we'll go to a comic con in Glasgow. I was thrilled. But then, out of the blue, he called to say it was canceled. I think the celebrity we wanted to see isn't coming, he mumbled over the phone. I was heartbroken. So what's the plan now? There was a pause. We'll figure something out, but we never did. My 21st birthday was a deja vu. Dad had booked us tickets to the Warner Brothers studio tour in London. But a couple of weeks before the trip, he called, The weather's going to be bad. We should cancel. I was hesitant. Are you sure? The forecast seems okay. But he insisted. And just like that, another birthday promise was broken. With the pandemic hitting soon after, our plans were further delayed. Every now and then he'd mention, We should rebook that trip to London. But deep down, I knew better than to get my hopes up. After all, history had a way of repeating itself. One evening, as we were finishing up dinner, he casually mentioned, You've got your student loan now. You can cover this, right? I was taken aback but nodded, pulling out my wallet. It wasn't a big deal at first. I mean, I'm in my 20s. It's only fair that I start paying for myself. But then, it became a pattern. There was this one time when he slyly said, Why don't you cover mine and Jane's meal too? I was puzzled. Do you think my student loan is some sort of jackpot? I wanted to ask but held my tongue. Money's been tight lately. With my master's degree, the loan amount has shrunk, and my part-time job at the pub barely covers my basic expenses. I've had to budget every penny, cutting corners wherever I can. So, when Dad asked about going out to eat last month, I hesitated. I can't this time, I said, hoping he'd offer to treat me. But he just nodded, not offering to cover me even once. It stung. It wasn't about the money, really. It was about the gesture, the understanding. Pound 15 might not be a lot for him, but for me, every pound counts. And more than the money, I missed the times when it felt like he had my back. The incident last week was like a slap in the face. I was chatting with my dad's girlfriend when she casually mentioned, Oh, by the way, we didn't get you any of the books you asked for. I tried to mask my disappointment, but inside I was fuming. It wasn't about the gifts, but the thought behind them. I mean, we had to budget this year, she continued, trying to justify. I thought back to the list I had sent them in October. Three books, that's all I had asked for. One of them was just pound seven. It wasn't about the price, it was something I genuinely wanted to read. Instead, I knew I'd be unwrapping the usual makeup kits that would gather dust on my shelf. I get it, times have been tough for dad. The accident with his hand, the strikes, the sick pay, it's been a challenging year. 
But then I think about the brand new BMW he proudly showed off a few months ago, the spacious four-bedroom house he lives in. It's hard to reconcile the two images. Talking to my dad feels like walking on eggshells. Like, when I was 16, we'd just roam around town with no real plan, and he'd kind of zone out when I talked. When I brought it up, he was like, well, why don't you come up with something? Another time, I mentioned we barely chat, and he went off on me, saying it's on me to reach out. But hello? It's a two-way street. I know it might sound like I'm making a big deal over gifts, but it's more than that. It's years of feeling this way. I just needed to get this off my chest. Facing him about it? I'm just not there yet. Last year, he got me these cheap Harry Potter baubles and a hoodie from Primark. I mean, I loved Harry Potter when I was 14, but come on, I've moved on. Plus, with all the J.K. Rowling drama, it's not even my thing anymore. If he'd just listened, he'd know I'm more into a song of ice and fire, Lord of the Rings, and gaming. And seriously, baubles? For Christmas? Everyone I've told thinks it's a joke. But he and his girlfriend defend it like it's some grand gesture. Oh, and speaking of Harry Potter, remember the Warner Brothers studio tour he promised for my 22nd birthday? Yeah, COVID happened, and he never rescheduled. My mom and her boyfriend David got tired of his empty promises and took me instead. We had a blast, but my dad, he acted like a kid who had his candy stolen. Every time it came up, he'd get all moody. If he was that upset, he should have just taken me himself. But the icing on the cake? This summer. He asked me to dog sit twice in August. The second time was for a cruise he and his girlfriend Jane got for free. I had to take time off work, which meant no pay for that week. When they came back, did I get a thank you? Nope. Not even a small token. My nan even called him out on it, and he's like, we bought her food. Seriously. A bit of food for watching their dog and house? Father of the year? Right there. One time before my dad took off on his trip, he was whining about how my grandparents, his own folks, hadn't visited him in ages. That bugged me, because it felt like he was just finding another excuse to dodge seeing me. I mean, the only times we'd hang at my grandparents was when he'd come around to see me. And guess what? He ghosted me the entire July, except for when he needed a dog sitter. Talk about priorities. Then in September, things went south real quick. Jane, his girlfriend, hits me up with this text about how no one's invited them for Christmas, so they're just gonna chill at home. She made it sound like I wouldn't see any of my family unless I made the plans. When I checked with my grandparents, they were like, It's September. Who plans Christmas this early? And the nerve of my dad to get Jane to send that message? Classic move. I was so ticked off that I shot him a long text, laying out all these issues. Yeah, I might have been a bit sharp, but his reply? I'm sorry you feel that way. Seriously? I blocked them on socials, but kept their numbers unblocked. Then Jane sends this essay of a message, trying to guilt trip me about the baubles and the dog sitting. And then she drops this bomb about them almost losing their house last year because of money issues. I'm like, wait, what? Then why is my dad driving a brand new BMW and why do they need a massive house for just the two of them? It just didn't add up. When my grandparents tried to get his side of the story, he made it sound like I was just some spoiled brat upset over gifts. He totally missed the point. It's not about the stuff, it's about feeling valued. He's always playing the victim, and I'm just done. Everyone's telling me to patch things up, but after all this, I don't think I can. Sure, he might be better than some dads out there, but that doesn't mean I have to put up with his behavior. If people think I'm being bratty or selfish for feeling this way, so be it. I've just reached a point where I'm done with the whole situation. Honestly, I think Jane plays a big part in this. It feels like she's pushing him to be tight with his money, making sure it's all about her. It's as if she's cool with them struggling financially as long as she's flaunting better stuff than his ex and me. I mean, yeah, he's being stingy, but it's like he's doing it for her. It's all kinds of messed up. It's heartbreaking to realize that not everyone is cut out for parenthood. Sometimes, for our own well-being, it's necessary to distance ourselves. It's tough, but self-preservation is crucial. If you enjoyed today's stories, check out the other videos on your screen now. Submit your own stories at you'rethejerk.com. Subscribe now or you're definitely the jerk.